Right. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, now, you'll know, a bit of order. Uh, <laughs> instantly seizes the room, right? Um, uh, we we're discussing uh, creativity, creative industries, uh, right from our first panel uh, this morning. Uh, and the RSA is making a big push to do more on this front. We're hosting now, as of two weeks ago, uh, the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Center. We've got lots of projects in the field helping nurture uh, those creative clusters. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be welcoming uh, to the festival uh, today uh, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, uh, Lucy Fraser. Fresh, fresh this week. The timing could not be better with having published the eagerly awaited and it warmly welcomed Lucy. Uh, SEC Division for the Creative Industries. Uh, Lucy's going to say a few words to kick us off, then we'll have a chit chat, and then over to you in the audience to ask Lucy uh, any questions on the Creative Industries. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Lucy Fraser. Well, thank you very much, Andy, and uh, it's such a pleasure to be here at this prestigious event. There's no doubt in my mind that the RSA is one of our great institutions, one with an illustrious history as an organization that has really been at the forefront of social impact for over 260 years, one that's been the home to radicals and change makers throughout history, Marx, Mandela, Marie Curie. When I was invited to speak at the RSA, like any good former barrister, I did my research. And I was struck by our shared outlook. I feel like we're singing different copies of the same hymn sheet. The RSA is about turning world-leading ideas into world-changing action, about helping shape a world where everybody can fulfill their potential. Grand ambitions, but ones that are grounded in realism. And my outlook as Culture Secretary echoes yours. I share a belief in optimism and positivity, particularly in the theme of today's festival, about what could go right. Because I represent a department which is absolutely full of potential and opportunity. A department that can level up an area through its facilities, its culture, and its jobs. A department that offers hope for young people and old people alike. And I want to come back to that important word that I see all over the RSA's website. And that word is potential. And I wanted to start with a story that I shared at the last month's Enders Conference. It's a story about a brilliant woman called Yetta. Yetta understood the importance of potential, opportunity, and optimism. Her parents were Russian, and they came to this country as refugees fleeing persecution, persecution in Russia. And despite a number of potential drawbacks of that age, being the child of immigrants, being Jewish, and being a woman, Yetta succeeded because she ignored obstacles. And she focused instead on the opportunity that she had been given to be brought up here in the UK and in her very own extensive potential. Yetta Fraser, my grandmother, became the first female barrister in Leicester, and she practiced at the bar until she was 80. And on every visit that I made to see her, she reminded me of a line in a poem by Robert Browning. A man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? It's a line about believing in your ability to succeed, taking advantage of the opportunity to realize your potential and never ever being afraid of failing. It summed up her life, and it is my guiding principle in this role. 
And I've recently turned, as Andy mentioned, to the particular issue of potential in the context of the industries that I represent. And this week, I've been setting out, along with the Chancellor, how I think government can and must realize the potential of our creative industries and what potential there is. Our arts, our musicians, our film and TV, our design, our production, our literature, project our values and our excellence as a country on the world stage. They enrich our lives and they make it worth living for countless of people across the country, indeed, across the world. And despite the enormous success of these industries and their indisputable status as a true British success story, I think we're just scratching the surface of what is actually possible. Working with industry, it is in our gift as a government to create conditions where our creative industries thrive for generations to come. Conditions where careers in the arts are not just accessible to a privileged few, but are a mainstay of local economies all across the country. One where those industries are a true vehicle for social change and a driving up force for leveling up in our towns and cities. They already account for one in 14 jobs in this country, and there's absolutely no reason why those numbers can't grow even further. And the only way of getting there is through a bold and coherent plan, working with the industries themselves. What I set out this week was a vision for how we nurture and support creativity in the UK from people's first day at school to their last day at work. It comprises a range of measures for young people to help them discover and nurture their skills at school, or through T-levels, or through apprenticeships, or through boot camps. Then we have targeted investments to help people when they are ready to start their own creative endeavors with investment from early ga stage game studios, grassroots music venues, and other creative pursuits. And then for those businesses, entrepreneurs, and artists who are ready to mature, they will find help and support to enable them to break into new markets, develop their ideas from prototypes, take them into products, and access really key mentoring expertise. I believe that there is a huge appetite across our creative industries to grasp these opportunities. Implementing the vision, we believe, will grow the industry by a further 50 billion pounds by 2030, support a million extra jobs by 2030, with a pipeline of talent and opportunity for young people. And when I spoke about leveling up, well, this blueprint has leveling up at its heart because what we're also doing is funding creative clusters to stimulate that local growth, provide opportunities for creative education and to train people in creative careers. At the same time as helping us realize the potential of these industries and maximizing the opportunities that exist, the vision that I set out last week is also about preparing the UK for the challenges of the future. I know when Andy joined the RSA from the Bank of England, he said that the RSA was best placed to tackle the challenges from technology to longevity. And these are among my priorities as Culture Secretary, because we need to prepare our sectors for leading the way in responding to challenges like those posed by AI understanding what it means for creatives and copyright holders, understanding how it can be harnessed as a force for good. And I really appreciate that no government has all the answers to how we maximize potential. It is only by working with great minds, like the ones in this room, that we can solve the enormous challenges that we face. And that's why the creative industries vision that I announced this week brought industry together with government. It was a truly joint collaboration. 
with particular support from Sir Peter Bazalgette and the Creative Industries Council. And that's why we need to continue to engage with all of you to help us realise the potential of our country. I've often thought that the way we solve problems is not just about what we do, but who we collaborate with to achieve it, and whether we do so in the belief that it's possible at all. I started by telling you a story about a remarkable woman called Yetta, and I wanted to leave you with a story about a remarkable man called Hyman. Hyman also believed in potential, and in particular, in people's potential. He was the headmaster of a technical college in Leicester, as well as being Yetta's husband. A few years after I'd been elected as an MP, I received an email out of the blue from one of his former pupils, who wrote to me and said, your grandfather was one of the most inspirational people in my entire life. Although he was a scientist, he recognized in me a youthful artist and did everything he could to set me on the path with the aims that have shaped my career. He had a huge part in shaping who I have become. My career has been as a costume designer in film and theatre. Dr. Hyman Fraser joins Harold Pinter, Ridley Scott and Franco Zeffirelli in having had a major influence in my development as an artist and as a person. But in fact, your grandfather was the first of those influences. I tell this story because I believe in the power of potential and opportunity. The power that believing in someone can have on their life. And I think everybody in this room, all of us here, in different ways, has an opportunity to harness the potential of others, to shape lives, to nurture talent, to foster success, both in industry and as a nation. Whatever can go right is much more likely if you have the right attitude and belief in potential. And even if we don't achieve what we have set out, we should still try. Because as Yetta would have said, what's a heaven for? This celebration you are holding today of the most imaginative and optimistic new thinking about the future for people, places, and the planet is something I am totally delighted to be a part of, working with you and for you. Thank you. Lucy, thank you so much uh, for that. For those at the back, there are some seats here at the front if you don't want to sit on the floor. Um, can I um, pick up, Lucy, on some of the fascinating points you, you raised about the unlocking of potential in the creative industries particularly, set out in the, in the vision document? Um, 50 billion pounds, million jobs, what's not to like? Um, <laughs> the question is, how? So yeah. what... What barriers need breaking down? What initiatives need putting in place to realize that potential by the end of the decade, which is not that far away, actually? No, it isn't. And the, the, the interesting and exciting thing is we're already on the way. So because of a huge amount of work that some incredibly brilliant and committed people have done, uh, we are already unlocking some of that talent. So we already have clusters across the UK. Um, so a lot, some of that already um, f started or funded by government, um, but it's not about government. It's about a collaboration of everyone together, and that is the key, because government can't do it on its own, and industry uh, benefits from the support of government. So we did create some clusters previously. Government put in £59 million, um, but the really interesting thing about that is that that leveraged £250 million from the private sector. And so that's what we're building on. So we're going to create six more clusters. We don't know where they are, um, but they are going to be a collaboration between um, 
what we need is we need government, we need local government, national government, we need universities, we need industry, we need finance, everybody needs to work together. So uh, that is how we will unlock the potential of any, any particular area. Fantastic. And, and, and as part of that, we'd all agree, as with any sector, it's about the people. Yes. And it's about the skills those yeah. people have. Uh, and as a country, we know we don't have the, we have a skills deficit. Um, what can we do, do you think, Lucy, to fill that skills deficit as it pertains to the creative industry? One of the fantastic things about the sector is it straddles the skills spectrum. It's not all high end, it's right down to uh, people making sets and yep. working in restaurants yep. and bars. And, totally, yeah. Um, how do we break down the skills barrier? So, so, first of all, you're totally right. There is a, a huge range of jobs in the creative industries. I think I read something that said there's 590 jobs. And it doesn't matter. Like when you think of the creative industries, you think about actors and producers mm. and directors. Um, you don't, I was at uh, Pinewood last week. I saw um, people doing modeling. I saw construction workers who are specializing in building the set. Uh, you need lawyers, you need yeah. accountants. So you need a huge range of different skills. So what the plan seeks to do, and that this isn't just a job for DCMS, my department, it's also yeah. a job for DFE, and I'm working very closely with Gillian Keegan, the Secretary of State for Education. But it's also, there's some role, well, massive role, not some role, massive role for industry itself. So what we are trying to do, I mentioned, so first of all, um, you will have, some of you might have heard the, um, the Prime Minister, the, the Chancellor announced wraparound care at the budget. And part of that is going to help women go back to work after they've had children. So I think, ah, oh, actually, this is an opportunity for the creative industries. What are we going to do in this wraparound care time? Um, so I'm working with the creative industries as to how do we fill some of that time, inspiring young children mm -hmm. and to be interested in the creative industry space. So just like lighting their fire as to the things that they might be able to do. So that's sort of the start of it. I mean, there's other things as well, like music, and that's really important. Um, but we need to make sure our T-levels uh, work for industry. We need to make our apprenticeships don't currently work for the yeah. sector because then people don't come in and work for a year necessarily, for example, on a film. So we need to unlock that issue. And then, as I was mentioning, we need to support everyone through their journey, help them, mentor them. And there's a massive opportunity for people who are already in jobs, but they might want a different job, so boot camps. And, but the industry plays a massive role because the government can't train these people. The, the government can't put on these courses. Uh, the government can't show them the fabulous things that are happening at studios across the country or in our game studios that I've been to. So industry needs to and it is doing, but can do more to uh, help people on their journey. And, and just on the, um, one of the things that came up this morning, Lucy, from the panel, we discussed a bit um, the early years, the educational journey, uh, and what more needs doing at the very start of the pipeline to attract that interest, to attract those, uh, to build those skills, and we do see, you know, it's great you're working with Gillian on this, um, but many of the arts and humanities courses we're finding are in decline. The number of pupils taking them up, whether it's drama or design, or, is falling over time. Um, how do we turn the tide on that so that the pipeline is there from the very earliest of years all the way through? Um, so we do need to do that, and there's a number of ways of doing it. I mean, I should stress, because we do... The creative industries are really important. We do need to ensure our children are also good at maths and the sciences, and they're not exclusive to, I mean, they are, in, uh, they are critical to the creative industries as well. So this is a, this is a pot that needs to be filled with all these things. Um, and, and of course, another area of my job is sport, and that's really important as well for a whole variety of reasons. So we need to interest people at a young stage, um, and we're going to do that. We also are building up specialist schools. So we've got the, the Brit School, got the London Screen Academy. Um, we've, I was last week at the National Film and TV School. 
um, fantastic institution. So was, when I was there um, at this school, which is a sort of a um, post-A-level school, they showed me the credits, an amazing promotional video that they had. They showed me the credits of everybody who'd graduated from their school. And they are on, they are, the number of people who are on award-winning uh, shows, films, is just phenomenal. You know, we are world-leading in this, uh, but we need to continue to do more. Let's go and collect some um, questions from the audience uh, on this theme of how best to unlock the potential uh, uh, in the creative industries. I think, sir, your hand was up first, so we'll just wait for the mic. We'll go there. Yeah, we'll start here. Thanks. Um, hello. I'm Nasmus. I'm 21 years old, and I co-chair One Young World's Content Champions Initiative. So one of my questions would be that uh, what's the next steps or immediate steps of your government in helping young people like me and also um, inspiring young people around the world on how they can take the creative sector as a platform so that they can create greater social awareness amongst people of what sh uh, sort of actions can be uh, taken on an individual basis. And that can be the, through the social media or the mainstream creative industries. What's the immediate uh, steps or action steps the government might be taking to create uh, a more socially aware world for the next 50 or 100 years? Big question, Lucy. Yeah. Right, How long have right. you got? Um, <laughs> So I do, I mean, I am constantly impressed about how socially aware our young people are. I go into a lot of schools. Going into schools in my constituency is the thing I enjoy the most. And the range of questions that I get about social issues, I am constantly amazed by. And these are questions that are coming from young people. Um, but I do think that we, we do, I mean, my department um, funds social action, so young people uh, understanding uh, social action, getting more involved in social action. Um, but I, I do think we, we have a world at the moment um, which has never been more socially and politically engaged. And I think, I think, uh, I think it's really important as a government that we... Um, this is more, less about social action and more about politics, but I think it's important. We need to make people understand what we are doing as a government in everybody's area, why we're doing what we're doing, and communicate it well. And often, I think, we are distracted, uh, sometimes by the media, on stories about things that aren't about what we're doing. It'll be more about what's going on behind the scenes, and I think that's sometimes unhelpful to how people view the world. Fantastic. That's great. My name is Ian Wixton, but this question actually comes from a lady called Liz Brandt, who's the chief executive of an organisation called Control Shift. We were here earlier in the week discussing education passports, but her question is about in what ways is the government supporting the arts and creative industries to foster innovation and economic growth at home and on the world stage into our future AI-enabled digital economy? Golly, there's a lot in that. Um, so, government is investing in the creative industries in the most significant way. So, we have invested £250 million in the creative industries since 2021. We are world class in creative industries on the world stage. I was at Cabinet the other week and somebody said, this hasn't, the fact that we are world class in this, that we have the skills and the talent that we have, it's not by accident. We have created that significantly through tax breaks that we've given to these industries, but also the collaborative working. So we've just announced 77, in the, in, the, um, in the announcement that we made this week, we've just announced 77 million more to support the creative industries. Another thing that you asked me about was AI. So AI is a massive opportunity and a massive threat to the world as a whole. And as a government, we've just published a strategy on AI. Uh, that's been led by a different department, by DSIT, um, but the predece my predecessor in my role, Michelle Dollar. Mm -hmm. And it's an area that uh, the uh, Prime Minister is absolutely focused on. Because AI is happening, whether we like it or not. 
And if we, the UK, do not get ahead of this game, everybody else is. So we need to make sure that we are absolutely focused on this. AI for my industries um, is a little, well, it's a challenge and opportunity. And a lot of people talk to me about the challenge. So for rights holders, it's a challenge. Because, for example, the music industry are really worried that all their um, talent, their creative talent, is going to be um, scraped and uh, mined, and they're going to lose the, the benefit of, of their creative work. So the IPO is currently doing a study uh, working with the industry um, on a code of practice. Um, so hopefully that will we'll get to some resolution uh, in July on that. But AI is also an opportunity, so I'll just tell one story. Um, so I was at a games factory last week, um, and uh, this, the, the, this brilliant woman who um, was an animator was showing me how she moved the character around to, you know, let it do what it was doing. And I said to her, are you worried about AI? Because it was just occurring to me that, you know, machine learning could do this. And she said, well, actually, we do use AI already, but it does all the boring things, all the repetitive things. And so I can spend my time on the new and interesting moves that we've not thought of yet. So I do think we should look at this as a challenge and an opportunity and be at the forefront in the UK. And one of the most inspiring things I've seen this year, actually, was on the stage a month ago, uh, Baz, Peter Bazalgette, was giving the president's lecture. He brought four or five Createch entrepreneurs with them. They spoke about what they were doing. It was unbelievably energizing and inspiring. So, huge opportunity there. We'll get the question here. Hi, I'm Nikki. My name is Nikki, and I've, I've worked for eight years in the subsidized theater sector at some of the world class organizations that you've talked about, the National Theater, and I'm at the Royal Court um, currently. Um, and I worked through the pandemic, which was a really difficult time for the arts, and I've experienced firsthand how that recovery is ongoing, how the people in the sector have left, and how a lot suffer from burnout, and it's great to hear how there's a, a promise to work with the education sector to get people more interested in the arts, but once early career makers get into the arts, how does the government plan on supporting them when everyone is experiencing such an under-resourced sector um, and still recovering from what has been a, a real, a real uh, state of recovery because of the pandemic with people not interested in the arts or paying for the arts in the way that they used to? So it's a really important sector, the theatre industry. I just, if you ho hope you don't mind if I just reiterate something, because, uh, so you mentioned COVID and the problems that were facing theatres. And uh, at that time, the government put 1.57 billion pounds into a culture recovery fund. And what that enabled us to do was to keep uh, industries like the theatres open so they did not collapse. And I've met a lot of, very lucky to have been to the theatre quite a few times in this role. I love the theatre. And I can't tell you uh, the amount, the, 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 uh, the amount of uh, support uh, and recognition that we've got from the sector for, for that 1.757 billion pounds. And I don't think the rest of the public have really realized the significant support that the government has given to the theatre sector and the orchestra sector. And, and, and so I hope you don't mind me just mentioning that. One of the first things that I did as culture secretary um, was to uh, help persuade the chancellor and make him see the benefit of continuing the tax credits that the theatre, orchestra um, and museums had during COVID and he continued them. And what I hear from the theatre industry is that has been really, really significant. In fact, this has never happened to me ever before as a minister. Someone sent me some flowers to say thank you and someone else <laughs> said she cried when she heard the announcement. So look, we can do more to support your sector and probably every sector in this room, but the government has really supported the theatre industry and we will continue to do so. Two more questions. Uh, one here and one, this gentleman's been very, very um, patient. And then we better wrap up. 
Thank you, Lucy, for a really inspiring talk about the potential within the current generation of children and unlocking their um, creative potential. I share your love of the arts and would have become an actress but didn't have the courage, so I became a doctor instead. <laughs> it's an obvious route, really. <laughs> Much easier. And I've spent the last 20 years in the front line of the NHS as a paediatrician, feeling increasingly despondent working in a hospital that I was picking up the problems for much wider issues in society. So four months ago, Michael Marmot stood on the stage just standing on and presented the data that for the first time, infant mortality has gone up in this country, that the life expectancy of women living in the poorest areas of the UK has gone down. And only earlier this afternoon, Henry um, Dimbleby spoke about the fact that 23% of children in school are on free school meals and have a household income of less than 7,500. So the point as a paediatrician is that in order to unlock someone's potential as a child, they have to be fed, they have to arrive at school not hungry, and they have to feel safe and secure. And we're living in a time where, because of the political decisions made by this government, people are poorer than they've ever been before. So I find it a little bit difficult to talk about unlocking the potential of this generation of children when we have a generation of children with the worst state of mental health, worst state of cost of living crisis, and actually feeling more insecure than ever about simply being fed. So the challenges that you highlight are extremely complicated and I don't think you can just, I, I think it's very difficult to say there's a very simple answer to the issues that you raise. The cost of living um, is something that the Prime Minister, the challenges that people are facing with the cost of living is something that the Prime Minister, former Chancellor, has identified as something that's absolutely fundamental that he needs to resolve. I, does anyone know how much the government has spent uh, in the last period of time since COVID on supporting families who are struggling with the cost of living? Does anyone want to guess how much it is that the government has spent supporting the people you're talking about at the bottom end of society to enable them to get by? Does anyone want to guess how much it is? 97 billion pounds we've given to people to enable them to pay their heating bills, uh, their energy. Um, it's a significant amount of money and the government doesn't have any money other than your money and we need to spend it wisely. So I totally agree with you. Children need support and they need food, they need a good education and those are the things we need to provide them. What the, what the Prime Minister has done is tr it's very hard to help everybody and he's tried to try to work out a way that we can target. And we spent 97 billion pounds doing that and we will continue to support people. Um, and that is very, very important. And there's a range of other measures as well that we're putting in place in order to help people. We've just been through a pandemic. We're fighting, we've, we've, we, Ukraine is still fighting a war, but I can assure you that the government is still thinking about all the issues that you highlight. Thank you, final question here. I am a fellow of the Landscape Institute. Um, for anyone who's not aware of our industry, we're the UK Landscape Architecture Accreditation Body, and some of the projects include the London Olympics, Manchester City Centre, and the Sheffield Master Plan. We're one of the major green industries in this country, but we're running into a really big skill shortage constraint. We only have a membership organisation of 6,000, that's including chartered landscape architects, students, and those training to be landscape architects. So my question for you, Lucy, is how do we tap into the young talent that you're talking about? Because actually most people have never heard of what landscape architecture even is. Now our, our organization has been trying to promote this through the student ambassador scheme, but because of our numbers and because a lot of practitioners overworked, most, 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 most practices that, 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 that that head over the walls for get, getting their own projects done. How, how do we actually tap into that? How do we actually realize the green industry and how do we actually go from old Keynesian economics into a future where the in green industry is actually the future, especially when you're trying to meet your carbon net zero um, targets as a government? 
So this is so. So it's a question about skills, and actually, you know, you you you're talking about a very important sector in, in relation to skills, and there. Are, there's a, we need to support so many different types of industries and get people to get the skilled, uh, best skilled workers. I represent a constituency in Cambridge. Um, and uh, within that, I think I have the most interesting constituency in the country because I have biotech, I have agriculture, I have horse racing, I have retail. I mean, I have everything that everybody uh, would have. I'm, I'm sure I have architects. And, uh, and, and we, it's, a, it's a perennial problem is how do we get people skilled up? And in fact, it's not just coming out of university, it's most of the people who are going to be working in jobs in the next sort of 15 years are already in a job. So how do we upskill them? And that's what we are looking at on a whole, but, but it's working with industry. The government can't solve all these problems. It's working with industry to do that. Uh, not I'm afraid not be able to. Maybe some other time, because um, we're over time, but I can't resist, Lucy, one last question. Um, theme of the day, what could go right? Um, leave us with a, an optimistic thought uh, about the creative industries or about the economy for us to seize on to and at the RSA run with them and make sense of. So I, I, I'll, I'll leave you with... Um, one of the most interesting things that I think about the creative industries. So, um, so when you, we talked about when you think about creative industries, you think about film, TV, and then I talked about some other things like model making, which you might also think about, or you know, construction workers or lawyers. So that's sort of stage one and two. Actually, there's a third stage, because the creative industries are the R&D for um, other industries more broadly, I'm going to give you two examples about how fabulous the creative industries are. So the first example is that the uh, 3D technology for gaming can do things like do um, an assessment of complex structures like the human body. And as a result of that, you know, if you've probably heard about the surgical arm robotics um, that are being used to do operations. UCH are doing those operations using this 3D gaming technology. In, and uh, they can do it at four times, so they can do prostate operations at four times faster the rate of a surgeon at the moment. So someone mentioned about children being healthy. We're cutting the NHS backlog down by using technology um, created by the creative industries. There's an example of a, um, a fabric maker in Devon who, um, so you think of fabric and fashion. Um, this company has made fabric that can travel at faster than the speed of sound and has helped uh, the latest trip to space by NASA. Um, that is the creative industries. So what can the RSA do? What the RSA can do and is doing is to bring these exciting companies together, uh, industry collaborating with uh, universities uh, with other industries, with governments, you know, use all your uh, expertise across the field to build these clusters that we're building across the country because it's only through that that we will harness uh, these industries and create a million new jobs and uh, make this industry grow by a further 50 billion. Please join me in thanking Lucy Fraser. Mm -hmm.